This is an old song that I learned from my daddy. Uh, little old man come in from the plow, dan do, dan do. Little old man come in from the plow, Tommy Clash, Tom Klingo. Little old man come in from the plow, said old woman got dinner ready now. Blurred and blurred and black and dago. Piece old dry bread laying on the shelf. Dan do, dan do. Piece old dry bread laying on the shelf. Tommy Clash, Tom Klingo. Piece old dry bread laying on the shelf. If you want any dinner, you can cook it yourself. Blurred and blurred and black and dago. Vast lands were available. Crops were planted and harvested. The economy was strong as money poured into the hands of the producers. Then, the economy crashed. The rain stopped, and the people felt the stinging dust. In the aftermath, thousands were left to struggle lest we forget the warning from forgotten lives. As the dust settled across the plains, inhabitants began to assess the damage. For as far as the eye could see, it was a scene from science fiction. Desolate and silent. Colorless and gritty. Questions of the future would be on the minds of nature's victims. Or were they humanity's victims? The Dust Bowl of the 1930s was an extraordinary period in environmental and human history. It was a benchmark between human complacency and changes that would protect the landscape from further degradation. In May 1804, Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark to explore the foreign land west of the Mississippi River. Along the way, they recorded their observations of the land, vegetation, and wildlife. The purpose was to assess the recent purchase from France and determine the possibility of expansion. Along the way, the explorers were to keep record of what they experienced and observed. As Lewis and Clark headed west, they would see a decrease in the amount of forest cover and an increase in the amount of tall grass prairie as they went from eastern Indiana into western Indiana. Uh, this tall grass prairie really uh, climaxed in central Illinois with grasses in height of five to as high as 10 feet. As Lewis and Clark headed west though, the grassland height in general decreased. So in central Illinois, the grasses again five to 10 feet high. Once you got into eastern Nebraska, eastern Dakotas, grassland height was down to about three to as high as five feet. And then finally, once you got into the western high plains, you encountered the short grass prairie. And at that point, the grasses went down to maybe a foot to as high as maybe three or four feet in height. Through word of mouth of a vast land hopeful of prosperity, 
farmers from the east would push the frontier westward to reap the benefits of the land west of the Mississippi. Once gold was found in the far west, opportunists began to make their own journey to increase their personal wealth. It was a chance to leave the horrors of debt and the drudgery of their lower class status. To encourage more settlement of the new west, Congress passed the Homestead Act of 1862. The act allowed individuals to obtain 160 acres of prairie for a small fee as long as they occupied and developed it for five years. This was an attractive offer that eastern farmers and merchants could not refuse. After all, the population of the United States was increasing and the government needed to set the foundation for commercial agriculture. When the Transcontinental Railroad Line was completed in 1869, additional railroad lines began to crisscross the landscape to provide food and supplies to the west and return nature's shining economic security to the east. The result of the Homestead Act and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad was the migration of millions into the plains. Towns dotted the landscape between the east and west. It was the promised land that would provide wonderful economic opportunities for many, unlike the conditions they left in the east. Farming in the east was difficult. The plots were small and congested with old trees that had to be cut down and the stumps removed. If trees weren't a problem, large stones and boulders had to be laboriously removed. Through decades of planting and harvesting, some fields became exhausted, unable to sustain a profitable harvest. Farmers dreamed of a land that was free from stumps and boulders and wanted to gain economic security from selling their supplies. The Great Plains was the answer. A land where the horizon was void of branches of hardwood matting the soil with never-ending roots. It was a land of opportunity like no other with rolling hills of tall and short grasses, green, lush, fertile, and undisturbed by human influence. Prior to settlement of the Great Plains, it was a massive, vast grassland that ran from southern and central Texas all the way up into southern Canada, Manitoba, Alberta, and this massive area of Great Plains was one of the largest, gr largest grassland complexes in the world. It can only be compared to the steppes of parts of far eastern Europe and Russia, as well as the Asia Minor area and the pompous areas of South America, which includes Paraguay and Uruguay. But by far, the, I really firmly believe that the largest expanse of grassland in the world, believe it or not, is right here in North America. Virgin land would soon be violated. It was a divine doctrine that the civilized would be given the opportunities provided by nature. Year by year, the farmers who lived on soil whose returns were diminished by unrotated crops were offered the virgin soil of the frontier at nominal prices. Their growing families depended more on lands, and these were dear. The competition of the unexhausted, cheap, and easily tilled prairie lands compelled the farmer either to go west and continue the exhaustion of the soil on a new frontier, or to adopt intensive culture. Thus the demand for land and the love of wilderness freedom drew the frontier ever onward. What was not considered in the equation thus far was the expense of maintaining the land. Larger equipment and more hands would be necessary to prepare, plant, and cultivate the fields. But hidden deep for tens of thousands of years in the vastness of the plains was its character. Farmers of the East were aware of the climate pattern of their original land. Rains were common along the colonial East. If the rains stopped, farmers simply did what previous generations did to save their dwindling crops. Till the soil to bring moisture-laden soil to the top, without the fear of it drying before the next rain. In the new landscape, 
Farmers practiced what they knew would work during dry periods. But the rain seldom came in time. They were unaware of the unpredictability of the skies. So they resorted to what they did in the east by tilling deeper to bring the much needed moisture to the roots of their crops. The result was devastating. Their method from the east failed. The relief they believed would come never did. Eventually, the rains came back. Relief returned and fear subsided. But for how long? At the turn of the century, the economy prospered. Industry provided evidence of growth. Cities boomed with success. The vast lands of the Great Plains were developed to supply the demand of urbanites, clearing the grasses from the fertile soils below. The Great War further demanded wheat and other crops to support military campaigns of the British, the French, and eventually Americans battling the Germans on the Western Front. Because of the demand, crop prices were at their highest. Farmers finally reaped the benefits of the land. More land was needed to supply the elevated demand. Technology made it possible. Teams of horses turned into mechanized creatures tearing through the earth. More land than ever before could be converted into fields. The future was golden. But looming behind the happiness of the farmer's success, was a disaster beyond human comprehension. On Black Tuesday, October 1929, the financial support of families, businesses, and farmers abruptly ended. All the banks closed. Wall Street crumbled. Everyone lost everything that was secured. Happy faces turned into hungry expressions. Bread and soup lines extended for blocks. The foundation that allowed farmers to obtain credit in the past turned to dust. The golden horizon of the Roaring Twenties quickly faded into a colorless future. Well, then. Oklahoma in about 1930. There happened to be a depression at that time. And my uncle owned a hotel in a small town of Chickasha, Oklahoma. And this hotel had a big glass front all across the front. And I used to sit in that hotel many a day and look across the street where people was lined up down the streets with buckets in their hand going to get a bucket of soup for supper. And uh, that's all they had. Every day they was back for another bucket of soup. Well, it was almost our turn to do the same thing until an uncle of mine purchased a farm. And we worked on the farm for him for $20 a month. And uh, we done pretty good for about five years. Crops failed, and so we sold out and started on the road to Arizona. In the financial aftermath, the rains began to diminish across the plains between 1929 and 1931, doubling the hardship for all concerned. Days turned to months. Months turned to years, and the harsh sun baked the land. Farmers did their best to provide moisture for their wilting crops by tilling deeper. By the time they finished tilling a field, the sun had completely finished off the remaining moisture. Each time a machine turned the soil to increase moisture, the soil lost an important physical character. Good soil holds together as a clod. A clod has small holes and bubbles that allow water to collect and remain in the soil longer. As tractors and teams of horses drive across the soil, it becomes compacted. Unlike moist soil, dry soil crushes into a fine powder, unable to absorb moisture when it does rain. To compound problems, not only are the Great Plains known for the vast grasslands, receiving less than 20 inches of precipitation a year, and extremely high daytime temperatures, 
they are also well known for persistent gusty winds. Treeless fields made it easy for the winds to sweep across the landscape unrestricted, stirring up the powdered soil into threatening clouds of dust. April 14, 1935. A day in American environmental history known as Black Sunday. Over the horizon, an ominous cloud of doom sent shivers of fear through the spines of the inhabitants of western Kansas. Many were unsure what was coming for them. Many believed it was the end of the earth. It was similar to a north storm that many had witnessed for years, but this one was different. In the north, and thought it was a blue norther coming, such a huge black cloud, just looked like smoke out of a steam tank or something. Well, I just come a rolling over, and when it got near to the house, he was all afraid, and he ran into the storm house because he thought it was a storm. And uh, we lit the lamp, and it was just so dark in there that we couldn't see one another. We just had, uh, even with the lamp lit, and we just choked and smothered. And my husband was out after the cow, and he stumbled up against the barbed wire fence, and he followed the fence till he come to the house. Is the way he was able to get to the house. I can tell you the story about the dust storm I experienced while I was. About uh, 1933, I believe it was. It was in the early, in the late summer, I believe it was. It come a, what they call a red dust storm. It's come from the west, from the red country west of us. And it just, it done lots of damage to the small buildings, blowed them completely away and tore the, the roofs off of the larger buildings. Some of them blowed the windows out of the houses. Turn cars over and things like that, a straight wind, no twister to it. And the dust was so thick that you could see nothing at all. You just absolutely couldn't see through it at all. Just as dark as it could possibly be. And it was that way for about 14 hours. It blowed steady that way. There seemed like there was no let up at all. It was as strong as it could be. You couldn't walk in it. And uh, we had to tie wet rags over our mouth. And just to keep from smothering, we get cloths and buckets of water and tied over our mouth down the cellar. And that one lasted so fierce for about two hours. And then we took courage and seen he wasn't going to blow away, and we went in the house. And we uh, wet blankets and hung over the windows. And uh, then after the first one, of course, we were scared, awfully bad. And the old timers said they'd never seen nothing like that. It seemed so fine. When major drought hit the plains in the 30s, uh, you already had the vegetation removed by cultivation. Prior to the 30s, there was a period that ran uh, from about 19, roughly 1920, right up into uh, to about 1930, uh, where we had very beneficial rains in the plains. So that actually caused more prairie to be uh, plowed in the plains and more areas to be cultivated. The problem was that without any prairie grass cover, which was the natural vegetation, when drought did hit in the 30s, the soil blew everywhere. And that caused a massive, massive erosion on a scale that probably had never, ever been seen in the plains, or at least hadn't been seen in the plains since the major, major mega droughts, uh, maybe the 1600s or certainly during the very last, very warm, dry period during medieval times. As the dust engulfed the air, many suffered from breathing problems. Livestock fell to the knees, choked from the harsh, gritty air. Inhaled dust became mud in moist lungs. Death soon followed. And we had cattle. We had cows that we gave $60 and some $90 in pure old money. And we it killed them. They was out in there. And uh, 
we uh, would cut their lungs open and it looked just like a mud pack or something. Mm-hmm. It just really showed it was the mud. Health issues were commonplace throughout the plains. Children suffered the most. Cloth masks were worn to keep the dust out of the nose, mouth, and lungs, but this seldom worked due to the fine size of the dust particles. This common malady throughout the plains was dust pneumonia. Homes throughout the plains were no fort against the swirling dust. Every tiny space left open allowed dust to blow through, making the interior difficult to see or breathe. Dust piled on tables and other objects, making cleaning difficult. When people went to bed and awoke the next day, a silhouette of their head was left from the settling dust. No matter how much families tried, the dust became a way of life. Our house was sealed, but that dust come through somehow. Even those stucco houses, by all around the doors and the windows, the dust would be all piled so high. And you just had to mop real good when it was over to get it out. You just couldn't get it out in the way. It was a losing battle. People did their best to seal their homes with paraffin-dipped linens placed in door jams, separations in window seams, and anywhere the barrier allowed dust to enter. In some cases, the house was so tightly sealed that the dwellers died from high levels of carbon monoxide released from kerosene lanterns. The scene repeated week after week, month after month. Confusion and despair were commonplace. It was tradition that the man provided for his family. The success of his crop brought food to the table. But the destruction left in the wake of drifts of dust and economic failure made farmers believe they had let their families down. How will we continue? Where are the rains? What am I going to do? Are we going to die? These were the questions asked by distressed farmers as they looked across the former green and lush landscape. From a farmer's standpoint, You've got farming in your blood, and it's part of who you are. You had to leave who you were behind because of this drought. It was devastating because it's such a part of your life and such a part of your heart. And for generations, all that hard farm work provided for your family. And for the first time, you can't provide for your family. The storms increased in frequency between 1935 and 1938. Homes and barns were buried in the drifts of dirt. Once thriving fields of wheat and corn were now fields of death. Herds of cattle lay dead across the landscape. Nothing was left to cultivate. The topsoil was gone. There was no water. The once lush and fertile grasslands were now a wasteland. Most of the topsoil ended up in the eastern cities. In Chicago, it was reported that approximately four pounds of dust per person fell over the city. During extremely gusty conditions, there were reports of ships in the Atlantic Ocean covered with a light blanket of dust. The impact of the Great Plains situation didn't concern Washington until dust filled the air throughout the city. Washington's response was establishing a soil conservation service to reverse the damage already done. To educate future farmers of the causes of the Dust Bowl, the government produced the film, The Plow That Broke the Plains. The film put the blame on the farmer who modified the land without restriction and regard for the fragile environment. The first fence. Progress came to the plains. High winds and sun, high winds and sun, a country without rivers and with little rain. Settler, 
now at your peril. Two hundred miles from water, two hundred miles from town, but the land is new. Throughout the depression of the 1930s, Franklin D. Roosevelt calmed the citizens of the U.S. with his fireside chats. On September 6, 1936, the situation in the Plains was the focus. My friends, I have been on a journey of husbandry. I went primarily to see at first hand conditions in the drought states, to see how effectively federal and local authorities are taking care of pressing problems of relief and also how they are to work together to defend the people of this country against the effects of future droughts. I saw drought devastation in nine states. I talked with families who had lost their wheat crop, lost their corn crop, lost their livestock, lost the water in their well, lost their garden, and come through to the end of the summer without one dollar of cash resources facing the winter without feed or food, facing a planting season without seed to put in the ground. That was the extreme case, but there are thousands and thousands of families on Western farms who share the same difficulties. Although hope seemed lost, there were some farmers and business owners who didn't want to leave because they were optimistic. They believed the situation would improve. For others, relief was too late. Forced from their homes, which may have been established several generations before, they hit the road without a planned route. All they had were the words printed on thousands of handbills promising golden opportunities beyond the Rockies. Everything they owned was packed in a jalopy. Mattresses, chairs, blankets, pots and pans, clothes, shoes, and personal objects to remember the happy days were piled high. The future was foggy. A life of happiness left when the rain stopped. As families pulled away from the front door of their home, they tried to show strength by not looking back at the place that brought so much happiness and prosperity a place that they believed would always be a firmament for future generations. The hardiest of humans would not be allowed to prevail over the land. The land won the battle. Unforgiving of what humans did, the land laughed as families drove down the road for the last time. It was almost as if nature was giving humans a taste of their own medicine. Unable to practice their livelihood, the future prospect of success was very small. All that they could do was dream of a place that would provide food, the staple of the future. Given the chance, former Plains farmers would do anything to provide to their families, just a place to sleep and meat to eat. Well, the reason I left Oklahoma, I couldn't find enough of work to do to support my family, me and my wife and six kids. Yeah, there wasn't nothing to do there but a little timber work, and when you cut a rick of wood and hauled it in town and sold it, you only got a dollar and a quarter, and you'd lucky if you sold it for the rick. Well, if they weren't in farm work, no fruit work, and when you was lucky enough to get a day's work, they paid you only 10 cents an hour. And I left there and come to California to try to support my family and to school them. Each hour sitting in a truck with the only possessions they had, they were probably thinking where they went wrong. Answers were less in number than the questions. Most of the questions concerned how to get through the day. Silent with distress, the only sounds adults heard were the laughter of children who were unaware of the future. I'm going down the road 
The future was too far in the distance. Each mile was more important than 100 miles. Unsure where the nightfall would stop them, food was the primary thought. As they migrated from the plains, they discovered that they were strangers among thousands of strangers doing the same thing, searching for the rumored promised land where jobs and food were plentiful. As families pulled into refugee camps, they must have had expressions of unbelief. Strangers meeting strangers of the same fortune. Camps not supported by the government were scenes of filth and crime. Hungry, they tried to sell anything they could just to have a potato or flour to make fried dough. Soups were thin. A can of sardines was saved over several days. What they could get was still not enough to feed the stomachs of the children. Many died as a result and buried in unmarked graves with only a few words about the life they lived. And we land on, on over in the Copus P camp at Point Conception, farthest point west in California, picking peas, and people was just about to starve to death, and no way to get any groceries. The road was very near blockaded between the towns and the point, and uh, people would go down to the preacher, and the preacher had a mother who had some money, she wired it in to him, and he would uh, take Six shooters, old tires, jacks, car pumps, anything and you could pawn for a little money to buy groceries with. And that went on for two or three weeks until people, until the peas got ready to pick and got dry enough to pick and the people went out and they never cleared any money, just enough to barely get away from there. In that dear state of Oklahoma, in the city where buildings are high, I laid on my pillow so hopeless, looking through my tin shack at the sky. I got up early next morning, out in the cold I did creep, walked off without any breakfast, and left two hungry babies asleep. And then I left that big city, I walked down 60 Highway. I had a good reason for leaving, so I headed for Pacific Bay. Then I seen the Texas Cotton, and the Mexico Bottomless Lakes, and the Arizona Healy Monster, and the Big Diamond Rattlesnakes. One night I heard the little coyotes. I listened to their pitiful whine. I wondered if the poor little creatures didn't have hungry babies like mine. That same night I dreamed of my father. He said, boy, don't never go back. I said, give them dummies your part of that city and that little old rusty tin shack. I started this poem on the desert, my bed lying out on the ground, then covered up my hungry babies and smoked a cigarette and laid down. Then I picked peas in California from two to six hampers a day trying to make a few pennies to drive that old hungry away. Oklahoma, farewell. People lost hope as misfortunes accumulated. Emotions were numbered by the continuing despair. Nothing was positive. Possibilities that gave a hint of hope quickly dissolved with tears. Eventually, even tears would be difficult to appear. Migrating families most often found themselves on the road for many days searching for jobs. Leaflets promised jobs, giving people a bit of hope. But due to the lack of mass communication, people didn't realize the vast extent of the drought and its influence on so many. If a job was within reach, by the time the family traveled to go get it, it was taken by another struggling family the crop was devastated by starving wildlife, or the company itself was corrupt. They felt betrayed. But they were survivors and got back onto the road to find other opportunities. A story of such a situation was recorded by Imogene Chapin as she and her family moved from camp to camp 
only to arrive in California with seven cents to her name. We left our home in Arkansas. It was in the month of June. To find a job away out west, of course we'd find one soon. We headed for Missouri, the old show me state. But jobs were scarce, they all told us. You're just a little late. <clears throat> then on to Kansas we did go, the state that grows the wheat. In harvest we would work a while. We'd have good things to eat. Here's work for everyone we thought. In fact, we almost knew it. They only shook their heads and said, the hoppers beat you to it. We would not let our spirits sink. We'd find work on the farm. I've heard it said most all my life, the third time is a charm. We'd go to Colorado, where all the lettuce grows. We had to cross the Rockies. We almost froze our nose. We thought we'd stop and ask for work and find a place to stay. A sandstorm beat us to that job and blew it all away. They told us then of Utah, some work we'd surely find. The cherry trees were ripe with fruit, the people all were kind. <clears throat> so once again we headed, our flipper down the hill. There was no doubt we really knew our pocketbooks we'd fill. But like the other places, a freeze had just struck there. And there was no job for us at all, the cherry trees were bare. No work in Arizona or Nevada, so they say. So on to California, we started on our way. They said in California that money grew on trees, that everyone was going there just like a swarm of bees. We landed here one summer day. How hot, I can't quite tell. I'll leave the rest of you to guess. I know you can quite well. The goat heads punctured our old shoes. The sun had baked our brain. We stayed out here about three months before we saw a rain. The ants, they bite, the flies, they buzz. Mosquitoes call you cousin. And when you try to take a nap, they bite you by the dozen. We drink our coffee from tin cans, eat sardines by the peck. If I could catch that fisherman, I'd break his gosh darn neck. We eat soup beans three times a day. We sleep on the floor. I guess you're tired of reading this, or I would write some more. I guess you wonder who wrote this. I know you think I'm crazy. You do not miss it very much. My brain is rather hazy. I tried so hard to find the trees on which the money grows. I walked through this hot sand so much, it's blistered by poor toes. Perhaps the money has all fell off, or just a little late. The one who wrote this crazy thing lives in cabin 228. Yes, what was it back in Oklahoma? What was the reason why that you left there and came to California? Well, I didn't have any home. No more than with the uh, rabbit, just, you know, just from one place to another trying to find work or something that would be... Just other words, just a place to put your head. Yeah, I just some place where I could get just half enough to eat. Didn't expect, you know, enough to eat or anything like that. How many have you got in family, Mr. I have four. Four in family. Your wife and yourself and children, is that right? wife and two little boys and sister. You couldn't make a living for your family back in Oklahoma? No, sir. So you had to go someplace where there was work? That's right. Well, uh, what brought you to California? What was the uh, main thing of coming to California? Well, of course, I was like most others. I had folks here, relation with wife and me. They would write, of course, to me that there was work and mm -hmm. ways of getting something to eat more so than it was in Oklahoma City. Now, the most of the reason that I'm here is on account of crop failures and different program. You see, I had a family of about seven children, and they were growing up. Well, the government come along, you know, and told us we'd cotton reduction. I lived on a farm there seven years. Well, I, I generally farm cotton, you know, for my money crop, that is to buy clothes and stuff through the winter that we had to have, you know, it generally the only money crop, and practically the only crop that country would grow in, in there where I live. And uh, that there was any cash money in. Well, the uh, government, you know, they they uh, come along, they cut off the cotton acreage. Well, there's some fault of mine that I didn't catch the hack of it. 
I uh, told them the direct truth of how much cotton I was planting. Well, there's where I made my failure. I might have been in Oklahoma yet. We were out in Arizona on the painted desert ground. We had no place to call our home and work could not be found. Started to California, but our money it didn't last long. I want to be in Oklahoma, be back in my old home. We out on the desert, where water is hard to find. It's a hundred miles to timber, and the wind blows all the time. You will burn up in the daytime. It gets cold when the sun goes down. I want to be in Oklahoma, be back in my hometown. You people in Oklahoma, if you ever come west, have your pocket full of money and you better be well dressed. If you wind up on the desert, you're going to wish that you were dead. You'll be longing for Oklahoma and your good old feather bed. The West was a lawless land divided between two societies, the migrants and the longtime inhabitants. Residents of communities lashed out at the dusters for fear that they themselves would be out on the road without a job. Some peach, grape, and citrus companies had a corrupt system and were deep in discrimination. In San Bernardino County, about around 1932, a lot of this uh, Mexican-American citizens, they never got together. And uh, it happened that they were being mistreated, just uh, like, uh, well, not mistreated because uh, sometimes it seems to be that uh, we're at fault for, uh, you know, American people criticize us like that because there is bad in every race, not only in ours. But it seems to be that uh, we're just getting the worst part of it around here, especially now that the, this strike came on. They think that we just don't want to work, but we just want to have some decent, you know, feeling and everything. I left beard one beautiful night The stars in the heavens were shining bright I was riding the bumpers which suited me fine Much better than the handouts on the TMP line I landed in Welford about 3 p.m. The cops watched me and I watched them I made him no effort, I give him no sign that I had been bumming on the TMP line. I decided to dress up in style, not look like a bummer, no, not by a mile. Rare back on my budget, give each man a dime, and that would be bumming on the TMP line. And then uh, and they, and most of these people won't move until they know something definite about the strike because they want to stick together until the end. They want to stick together until see what happens because they know if the growers beat us, we'll be in the same peon state for about 10 more years that we have been all the time. In those ranches, it got to be that if we talked back or even sang in the orchards, or talk, you know, with somebody else picking around there, the bull would come up to us and tell us, you better shut up, you're not supposed to sing, or you're not supposed to whistle, you're not supposed to do anything, like peons. It isn't the, qu for my part, it isn't the question of so much of wages, but of the reaction, the way the bosses treated the people. That's most of it. There were divisions within the families as well. Fathers disappeared, unable to cope with the lack of supporting their families. Mothers were left with the burden of finding a job to feed their children. When I got the planting cotton, 16 acres was my allotted share. Well, me with a large family that planted cotton, you know, just for what we could uh, gather and handle ourselves, well, that made another condition. One of the boy, the boy, the oldest boy, says, there's no use for me staying here. We can't make a living here. One of the girls says, 
there's no use of me of staying at home because there's just so much cotton and, and that's all the work there is to do. Why, we'll hunt us a job. Well, they've taken off for uh, jobs and they're, they'd work around different places, you know, railroad. The girl, she got a job in the, on a farm a keeping house for a while and she went to uh, Muskogee and worked for her family, I think about two years for one family now she's been with it. Well, uh, they moved to Tulsa and then she's been with them constantly ever since. Um, but then uh, what it did was to, it tore up the family. This is Mary Campbell. This is Betty Campbell. We're from the Shaft of Government Camp. We're going to sing the Government Camp song. Over in the government camp, that's where we get our government stamps. Over in that little rag house home. Over in Unit 1, there's where the people have their fun. Over in that little rag house home. Over in Unit 2, there's where the people don't wear any shoes. Over in that little rag house home. Over in Unit 3, there's where the people live in Jamboree. Dotted through the Great Plains and in the western states were camps established by the Farm Security Administration that gave some hope of better living conditions and prospects of finding stable work. These protective establishments were created by the government to assist Dust Bowl farmers forced from the land. Hope filled the air when migrants arrived to find running water and self-governed committees. Activities were created to keep mines occupied. Dances, writing for the camp paper, and crafts were popular. Men gathered around tables telling stories of their journey. Although conditions were sometimes better, poems and songs that were common in the camps left posterity a sample of what life was like for the migrants. These were simple people, mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, grandpas, grandmas, aunts and uncles. Their stories left a footprint for the future, simply stating what was on their minds. Way downtown, I feel mighty funny. Picked up pocketbook, stuff full of money. Man on the corner said, Where are you going, Sonny? And I told him not to agree about me. While I'm gone, is don't you grieve? While I'm gone, is don't you grieve? While I'm gone, is don't you grieve? Or don't you agree about me? Went to the hotel, stay all night. Turned six bits and I said, All right. Went upstairs and Downstairs my breakfast deep Jumped on a table and a pig and eat And that I told not to grieve about me Got on the train without a cent of money Long come conductor looking mighty funny Pat me on the head said Where are you going sonny And I told not to grieve about me Got the next station he put me off You're not done you for I had a bad call I left Texas one beautiful day. I made up my mind that I would not stay. No longer in Texas, the place that I love, though it was like giving up heaven above. My old dad was growing old. His body was bent from hard work and toe. My mother was sleeping in a gay little town where friends and her loved ones had seen her lay down. My sisters and brothers, they hated so bad. 
To see me go west like someone gone mad. To leave all my loved ones and kiss them goodbye. Just hoping I'd meet them in the sweet by and by. In 1939, the rains returned, ending the greatest drought in North American history. Out of the chaos of the last decade, only a handful survived the Dust Bowl. Those were the people who survived the ridicule, the hard times, the starvation, the stress of finding a job, wondering when the next meal would come, trying to find a way to support their family in a time when it seemed no one cared. The Dust Bowl is not the story of any one individual, but the story of the masses. The forgotten thousands were the storytellers for the future. Would the lessons they left in the fields of dust be forgotten? All citizens of the United States suffered, not just the farmers. Merchants, teachers, industrialists all relied on the state of agriculture. It was the foundation of the nation. Once it fell, everything fell with it. What made this event so significant was twofold. Humanity's desire for wealth amplified by nature's natural fluctuation. Today the planet is faced with soil degradation and dwindling water resources. Exhausted soils in Haiti have forced mothers to make food for their children from dirt and fat to fight off hunger. Ethiopia, Sudan, and nations in the Sahel continue to face famine caused by persistent drought conditions. Spain has recently seen the effects of global climate change with continued water shortages. And finally, the United States. Overgrazing and dwindling water resources from the Colorado River and underground aquifers are becoming a major concern of water management and soil conservation agencies. The Dust Bowl was not an isolated situation in the past but a situation that is reappearing again that all inhabitants of our planet should act upon today. In the final analysis, thousands provided future generations with the answer to success and prosperity. Understand the limits posed by the natural environment. Never take nature for granted, for it's as fragile as the most delicate flower. Each disaster we witness in the future will be a reflection of what our ancestors experienced. What we do today will influence what happens decades from now. Understanding the past is the key to the future. Remaining complacent brings only destruction for future inhabitants of our planet. It's just human nature. When things are going okay, everyone grows complacent. When the rains are there, People get comfortable, when the, but when the drought returns, we realize we are vulnerable to nature's wrath. The young lives that experienced the devastation have willed us this important lesson. Our obligation to them is to remember the faces of the children and to take account of what is important to each of us. Their memory lives in our children of the future, a memory never to be forgotten. An old and faded picture on the wall That has been hanging there for me a year It's a picture of my mother and I know There is no other that can take the place of mother on the wall